Well, good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and we'll get started. It's 2.15. Um, my name is Nate Zeman. And I'm one of the offering managers with IBM Cloud, and I have the pleasure of, of uh, introducing this hour's session called Don't Just Take Our Word For It, where we hand the mic over to uh, two companies that we have been working with that have chosen OpenStack as part of their solution. Um, and they're here to tell you about uh, their journey with OpenStack, um, the reasons that they've chosen it as a technology choice, um, and where they're going with their use cases. Today we have Materna. You may have heard, of, heard them in the keynote this morning um, in their choice of OpenStack plus Blue Box, and um, AT&T, who is here talking about their choice of OpenStack for object storage with Swift and OpenPower. Um, we'll be doing uh, two different use cases that are obviously very separate from each other. Uh, Materna will be going first, then handing over to AT&T with questions afterwards. So, uh, Armin, you want to come join us first? Thank you. Huh? Ah. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Armin von Dolenga, and I'm working as a senior IT architect and as a consultant at Materna. Um, I'd like to give you a brief outline of OpenStack at Materna. But let me start just with introducing Materna. Materna is a system integration and consulting company founded in 1980 and headquartered in Dortmund, Germany. We have 1,700 employees and a turnover of 230 million euros. Materna enables a broad range of services for our customers, service you, services you might have been using. Materna acts totally vendor independent and has partnerships with all leading vendors in the market. We have been an IBM premier partner, a business partner since 2006. Our challenges are many, depending on the role we have in each specific customer situation. We act as a consultant and advisor in many of our business relationships. We advise the customers on strategic IT decisions, build and modernize their platforms and runtime environments. We develop some of our customer environments, sometimes over the course of decades. In these customer situations, our consultants must be experts in how to transform the IT into a modern and agile architecture. For other customers, we act as a software developer, so we have to maintain test and development systems. Our various teams work on <coughs> sorry, many different projects. We have long-term relationships with our customers. This means that different versions and even different technologies for applications have to be supported over time. All these environments have to be operated and supported in parallel. And Materna acts also as a service provider. For some customers, we are service, <coughs> we are service provider and host, deploy and manage full business applications like applications for mobile service providers or web-based customer business applications. We deliver applications for the German customs service, for example, and other public institutions. Many of them are requesting data locality, some kind of German cloud. As well, we deliver infrastructure automation and service management solutions for many big customers in Germany and Europe. You probably know us from several airports all over the world because we deliver self-check-in and self-backdrop systems. First, let's have a look at the stack provided on-premises. On the left side, you will find internal services, services which are consumed by ourselves, like mailing, billing, CRM systems, etc. On the right, you will find managed service. This stack represents a highly available data center that provides services for clients. These services incorporate mainly software as a service and business process as a service, like incident management systems and services, 24 times seven monitoring and support. Infrastructure as a service and platform as a service is not on our regular portfolio on this managed service stack. These services still are on premises, grown over the years historically and have not yet been moved to off-premises cloud, but uh, plan to be moved partially. 
but there also are client services which can't be moved to an off-premises cloud because they are bound to Materna data center by contract or due to software li license which isn't cloud ready. The right side of the slide shows Materna off-premises cloud services varying from infrastructure as a service to business process as a service. We are able to offer more services than on-premises. Materna on-premises cloud service may be consumed in-house by our developers or by our pre-sales folks. The latter may, for example, need a demo environment set up for a few days or a few hours. And of course, we will have the Materna off-premises cloud for our clients. So why go for OpenStack? Of course, there's the market momentum OpenStack has developed, which we definitely do not ignore. Typical drivers are scalability. We have to fulfill the scalability requirements of the hosted applications. Furthermore, in our development projects, the need for a highly scalable environment arises when executing, for example, load tests. Speed is essential in our development scenarios, which have moved more and more to agile methods following our customers' needs in going to market within tight schedules. Therefore, we are following the DevOps spirit of the agile world of continuous integration and continuous development and deployment. Interoperability and portability by using OpenStack allows to use the same APIs and the same functionality everywhere. Therefore, it makes no difference whether a virtual machi machine is provisioned on OpenStack in your own data center or in any OpenStack cloud environment. Cost. On one hand, you may reduce licensing cost by using OpenStack open source virtualization. On the other hand, you may, you may find scalability, speed, and portability useful. Scalability, <coughs> scalability, you have no more need to pay for peak performance. Grow as you need and shrink if you don't need it. Speed in development is also reducing project costs. Portability, you may scale out for peak workload to the most efficient provider. And of course, we are vendor independent. It's a major quality of OpenStack. So at Materna, we started with a grizzly release. It was a pain to implement it due to problems with the available hardware. And finally, we did succeed with Icehouse. We encountered many problems during the release upgrades on our way to the Liberty release. Liberty was and still is the release up and running for internal use, mainly for development. The experience has taught us that we better set up a Materna private cloud pro production, which is for our customers, by using a managed OpenStack solution we must provide a production environment for our customers and want, don't want to care for the OpenStack components and how they fit together, nor would we care for release upgrades anymore. Due to the grisly release experiences, we were looking for dedicated hardware, separated from the fish tank concerning performance and data location. And it should be located in Germany as an alternative to on-premises. So we evaluated IBM Bluemix Private Cloud. It is managed OpenStack, dedicated hardware, off-premises, and located in Frankfurt. Next, as an overview, let's have a look at the concept of Materna Private Cloud having multiple tenants and multiple projects on Materna um, private cloud. A project or parts of a project may be ordered via an OpenStack-based service portal, supported by an OpenStack automation and orchestration layer. Using the OpenStack API to deploy and run services on different OpenStack clouds. To start implementing the contents 
or to be more precise, to extend Materna private cloud and leave the Materna customer data center, we first of all had a proof of concept concerning OpenStack managed services on IBM Bluemix private cloud, formerly known as IBM Blue Box. So my excuse is if I still call it IBM Blue Box. The proof of concept ran for about three months. It was successful, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't use Bluemix private cloud right now. We could not test the release upgrade during that proof of concept, but there have been several minor updates. No problems and no interrupt of services. The POC was mainly supported by Ruben Ardus and M Michael Weisbach, so special thanks to them. The next step was to expand our VMware infrastructure to Bluemix infrastructure, uh, formerly the soft layer um, data center, also in a POC. The purpose was not only to test the VMware in-house to VMware soft layer interconnection, there was also the intent to attach to OpenStack on Bluebox using the soft layer infrastructure. So same scenario as you usually have within your own data center. Next step was to expand our VMware infrastructure to Bluemix infrastructure, also in a POC. Oh, sorry. Um, and we also were, <laughs> were deploying other systems residing on soft layer. So the final step was to cross-link all systems that we had created off-premises on a physical basis within IBM soft layer data center infrastructure. By the way, the systems must not reside within the same soft layer data center. You can spread them across all soft layer data centers where this kind of hardware is available. And as a benefit, data traffic within the soft layer data center is for free. So why, why would we do this? When you start shifting workload from your own data center to an off-premises cloud, you will have the same requirements for data center operations as you have on your on -premises, uh, for your on-premises workload. You have to monitor what's going on, collect performance data, manage incidents, backup databases, etc. You may, for example, set up a backup infrastructure of premises, especially for VMware workload. Of course, it may, may also be used for the Bluemix infrastructure private cloud. Maybe you don't want to keep the backups within Bluebox. It's highly available, but nevertheless, it may fail completely. In this case, we better have our customers' data outside Bluebox to restore it on other OpenStack instance. We don't want to miss our SLAs, of course. Finally, let me mention security logs. We don't want to store those logs within Blue Box. They have to be stored outside this environment. They must be preserved for auditing and compliance reasons. Why should we send them directly to our data center? Stored on separate hardware within soft layer, we can access the logs when needed. That's why we need interconnected systems, at least some of the reasons for it. And if we are driven by our customers to run OpenStack application and services on-premises, government or customs or any public institution, we may install Bluemix private cloud local. But before doing this, we will have, make a guess, a proof of concept, of course. Thank you so far, <laughs> Michael. Thanks, Armin. My name is Michael Weisbach. I'm working with IBM, and it's a pleasure to meet you here as in, in Barcelona. Um, it's my duty to uh, give you a very brief overview about the solution we use in Materna. Um, it's, uh, as already mentioned, the IBM Bluemix private cloud. Uh, we very recently renamed the product. Uh, you may know this product as uh, Bluemix, Bluemix dedicated. Uh, Blue Box dedicated, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, 
Um, because of various reasons, uh, Martiana chose the uh, IBM uh, soft layer data, side, uh, data center side uh, Frankfurt. Uh, but we are able to deploy the solution into any of the uh, soft layer data center, of course. Um, we uh, chosen a dedicated controller setup, uh, so the uh, blue box solution is able to be set up in a um, converged setup, so controller functions and compute functions as well uh, into one box. Um, but here in this case, we, um, oh sorry, uh, for dedicated controllers, which brings us additional functionalities or capabilities within the blue box environment, uh, like uh, load balance as a service uh, version two. Um, on the compute node side, we uh, decided for enterprise compute nodes. Um, there is also a standard compute node, which is about half the size of the enterprise compute node. Um, so 64 um, uh, compute cores, each node, uh, 260, uh, 256 gigabyte memory. So very typical uh, setup, right? And uh, a 2.4 terabyte of disk, internal disk for ephemeral storage and attached to the soft layer network uh, via 10 gig uh, network connectivity. Um, we also have deployed or installed a, a block storage uh, based on Ceph, um, roughly uh, 24 terabytes in total. Um, so to provide us a central volume service. And right now this uh, Blue Box or IBM Bluemix private cloud 3.0 um, is uh, based on the Mitaka release. Uh, looking forward to what's next, um, the um, Blue Box slash Bluemix private cloud release 3.1 was released very recently. So we are still on the Mitaka release. Uh, but we will get uh, some uh, additional functions. Uh, for instance, a very important uh, feature for uh, clients like or cloud service providers like Matana. Uh, we will have the federated Keystone customer identity provider, so we are able to implement single sign-on uh, federation based on OpenID Connect or Summer. Um, as well as uh, we got some improvements uh, within the storage area, so to do the um, uh, Ceph version we use uh, in the 3.1 release. And finally, and this is also a very important fact uh, and, and feature for uh, Matana and any other Germany or clients uh, based in Germany, we got uh, several compliance um, statements, so ISO and uh, SOC, uh, SOC 2, 2 and 3 uh, type 2 compliance, which is also important for yeah, storing or running sensitive workloads. Um, yeah, more to come. Um, this is our final slide uh, about Matana, uh, and it's a pleasure to uh, hand over to the second use case we would like to introduce to you today. Uh, it's the team from AT&T. So please welcome the AT&T team on stage. Can you hear us okay? Okay, good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, counted. So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacob Caspi. I'm a principal systems architect at AT&T, responsible for our uh, cloud architecture. Uh, with me is Tom Matthews, a distinguished engineer from the power systems at IBM, and um, somehow, somehow Kiko's name is not here. Kiko Rice from uh, Canonical. Uh, uh, I would like to thank IBM and their uh, uh, Open Power Lab in, uh, uh, team in, uh, in Austin for helping us do this uh, proof of concept. It was definitely pressed it a lot to make it happen, as well as uh, uh, Cindy Bilowitz from uh, the AT&T architecture team who helped run all the tests for us and could not be here. So. 
with that, I'll let uh, Tom talk about what open power is. So, uh, <clears throat> so what is open power? Open power is a hardware and software ecosystem um, uh, you know, that is completely open in its nature, right? I mean, this, the, the stack is completely open. Uh, it's uh, from the chip up ecosystem. Uh, it's, you know, completely open. It's community based. Uh, when I when I say from the chip up, I'm talking about you know from from the actual processor chip to the systems that get designed in this environment uh, for this environment, the I/O, and then the software st software stacks on top of it. Right? Um, I mentioned it's community based. We have over 250 or 225 uh, members that are out there developing you know various aspects of of the stack as we move forward. Um, a very, you know, sort of significant focus, and, and, and so I, I hope everybody uh, uh, in the audience has, has heard of power before, right? I mean, is, is that this is a, you know, uh, risk-based architecture that, you know, IBM is building service for a very long time around it, right? And, and as I said, we've, we've fully opened this up in the context of this open power environment. So a customer, you know, uh, that, that you know, buys open open power can get a fully fully open um, uh, stack for their environment. Um, you know, we have a broad set of partners. Uh, you know, that are that are that are part of open power. Again, doing development, you can see some of the. Um, if you have really good eyes, you can see some of the names on the chart. Um, a, another very strong focus around open power is really around um, acceleration, right? Uh, um, as you know, things have moved for, forward. Um, you know, uh, getting more and more out of the chip. Uh, you know, cost performance out of the chip, right? I, I mean, physics and more law, Moore's law. Um, you know, have, have been influenced by that. And so now the trend to get to cost performance is really to get to to accelerators that are outside. You know, outside of the processor and so forth. So that's a another very big focus of open power. Um, these. Uh, open power boxes are are targeted at scale scale out environments, so so they're very good for cloud. They're very good for HPC and analytics. Uh, they're very good for scale out, um, you know, commercial environments that exist. And the other thing that open power is is the basis of our uh, of our proof of concept. We used. Uh, Power 8 servers in this environment for, for um, the Swift object deployment that we're going to talk about. Um, and we've, we, we saw some very significant benefits, right? I mean, the characteristics of, of power, um, uh, ha uh, power has some, some very strong um, industry leadership characteristics, things like, you know, more threads, more cache, more throughput. And, you know, those, those characteristics really came to bear when we went off and did our work, right? We saw, you know, fairly significant uh, performance results uh, within this SWIFT cluster running on top of open power. Okay, so uh, SWIFT is, a, uh, is, a, is an object store database, I'm sorry, object store so, um, uh, solution in, in large scale, it is an, uh, a Swift. Uh, uh, Swift is an OpenStack project, and uh, uh, Canonical, or Chris uh, Kika from Canonical, um, has been helping us in terms of developing the stack for OpenStack to put on this um, on this uh, proof of concept. So I'll let uh, Kika uh, uh, describe what Swift is and now how it can help us. Sure. Thanks. Um, so, as Jacob introduced me, I'm a Vice President for Product at Canonical. I'm focused on storage and bare metal provisioning. Um, and we've been working with both IBM and AT&T setting up Swift on these servers. Um, essentially, Swift is an object store with a two-tier architecture. All the requests from the end user perspective goes to the Swift proxy. And the name proxy is a bit misleading here because in reality, the Swift proxy is what everyone engages with. Um, and in the back, there are object storage daemons that essentially are storing the data that the proxy is streaming through. In this case, uh, let, me, well, and let me just close off talking about why Swift is interesting. So Swift is great because it provides both its own object storage API, but an S3 compatible API as well. It lets you store 
bas basically any type of object, any size of object, and it knows how to distribute those in a way that is scalable and performance. It handles failure of individual storage nodes, and you can have multiple proxies set up. So in other words, both elements of the tier here can be killed, and the service still stays up. There's no requirement for anything really on the hardware other than enough disk space and fast enough networking. In other words, you don't need hardware RAID on the nodes. It can be any class of hard drive. And the algorithm and the code itself handles moving data around as it needs to be rebalanced and recover from failure. In this case specifically, we're not only looking at Swift, we're looking specifically at a feature that was added in Kilo and stabilized across Liberty and Mitaka, which is erasure coding in Swift. Erasure coding in Swift is interesting because the way it's done is different from how it's done in Ceph. The, the proxy is the components in Swift, which actually does the erasure coding calculation, which means it takes in the object that the user provided, it breaks it up into chunks, it calculates the parity blocks, and then that's what's sent back into the object storage daemon. And this is why my issue with calling it a simple proxy is because in reality it's doing more than a proxy is. It's now actually cutting up data, it's calculating parity blocks, and then streaming those back into the object storage daemons. Um, it's interesting also because in Swift, because the proxy is doing the heavy lifting of calculating um, the erasure coded blocks, there's a higher CPU load typically on the proxy server. And this is why this experiment that we did here is actually interesting to show what the impact is on a power. Uh, so uh, <coughs> Tom will talk about what was the lab configuration. Right. Uh, so the, the lab configuration was uh, six object uh, uh, um, uh, storage servers. That's what we used. Uh, the servers themselves were S, uh, uh, S22 LCs. LC stands for low cost uh, open power servers, um, five, 512 of RAM, um, uh, uh, dual port, uh, 128, uh, 128 gig SAS uh, HBA controller. Uh, um, you know, going out to the storage. Uh, the storage itself was based upon um, six uh, um, super micro uh, uh, f uh, 4U90 uh, um, storage drawers in the environment. Uh, there was a dedicated proxy server. Um, the, the data network was 100 gig. The management network was one gig, and the software was was uh, you know Ubuntu-based, Swift, of course, and, and on the Mataka release. Uh, just one note, you know, this this is a very powerful server, um, and that's the server we used in the lab to see how much we can stress the environment. Uh, probably if in real life, we can get away with a lot less RAM and probably less right. cores on the CPU. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so what was the proof of concept? We had uh, two, um, two goals or two uh, uh, items we wanted to test as part of the proof of concept. The first was make sure that Swift works on power in uh, Ubuntu stack the same way it would have worked on an X86 platform. Uh, the other was to see how far uh, we can stress the environment to see uh, the benefits of open power um, on on the environment. And uh, one thing I, I wanted to uh, uh, mention is that AT&T has a huge amount of data that we store between uh, our own uh, records and, and calls and um, messages and whatever it is, whatever else we store. In data, uh, we're always looking for bigger and better way to, to uh, and more efficient way to store data. As you may know, because um, we made that public, we have somewhere between 100 to 200 data centers running Swift, and all of these are generating a huge amount of uh, storage that we need to account for. And there, that's why we are. Although we're currently running on 3x replication, we wanted to make sure that we are running very efficiently uh, a, an erasure coding environment to make, to make sure we can take better advantage of the hardware. Uh, so with that, you know, we, we, the initial testing was four data, two parities, and that's only because we had uh, six servers and 
we couldn't do more than that. Uh, but we tested all the other, the other functionality that we're looking to test as AT&T, so as the security, uh, life cycle, uh, data, data hierarchy, in-stream uh, modification of data, encoding, decoding, etc. So this is what we found out, uh, with, especially with these machines, is we, we started uh, with, with small loads, and we went up to, uh, um, to much higher loads of about 2,000 objects over these six machines. And as you can see from this graph, um, we didn't even touch, on the average, um, um, more than 50% of, of, the, of, of the CPU on these machines. And that's increasing the workers to as many as 64 workers over these, these uh, six machines. Uh, and uh, the other thing is while we're testing it, we're looking to uh, well, how, many, how many read success ratios we have or what was the success ratio. As you can see, it didn't matter how many, how many certain workers we put um, on, on, the, um, on the servers and the object size, it still remained a fairly constant 74, seven, uh, about 74 percent a success ratio, meaning the first read, and if it didn't work, it would do the second read. So the conclusion on, 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 on this test, which was very promising for us, was that uh, we couldn't stress it high enough to actually uh, overload the system. And that was, that was a very important uh, discovery part of this, uh, this uh, proof of concept. Uh, of course, none of this would be would make you know sense unless we had the repeatable solution, and this is one of the things that Canonical can provide. So, uh, Fikiko, if you can elaborate more about that. Sure. So, first benchmarks are generally pretty hard to do, even on a single node, and with any sort of scale-out software or big software, as we call it. Uh, you have the challenge of having to benchmark across a complex system because you've got multiple nodes with different um, features and, and different requirements upon them and you want to measure and aggregate that. The most important thing about a benchmark is being able to reproduce it reliably. And so the work we've done in Maz and Juju, which is our tooling and automation for doing deployment, makes it so that anyone who wants to deploy across any substrate, be it, be it x86 or power, can just use those tools to get a swift cluster up and running. And it's a single option for you to turn on erasure coding policy for one pool that you have, and then you can start using it. So essentially, what we provide in terms of software, which is entirely open source, none of it is charged for, there's no gating, you can get all of this stuff from us directly, and it allows anyone who's doing evaluation of any architecture to quickly spin it up. Um, and if, you, if you're interested, you can contact us and we can talk a bit more about how we did the actual test setup, how the benchmarking was done, so you, you can reproduce on your side and, and get measurements that are accurate to your network and your infrastructure. Okay, so with that, uh, I think we have concluded uh, the presentation. Um, any questions from the audience? I guess, oh, yeah, go ahead. So the question is, how are we using containers? Yeah, so, so one thing that we didn't really, um, you know, we talked about, showed the single cluster performance numbers. There's actually three clusters in here. Um, uh, th you know, three of those uh, same clusters that we showed right here. And, um, and so the container sync is, is, you know, being pushed across those three clusters. So you were probably kind of curious, why would somebody talk about a cluster, a container sync in the context of a cluster? There was actually three of these. Three of these. So the container sync is currently in, in the testing phase. It's a, um, erasure coding with container sync is a fairly new feature. Uh, so we have not put that into production yet, and this is exactly what we're doing now. Any, anybody else? Okay, so any question to the previous uh, presentation? Okay, with that in mind, thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thanks, Thanks very much. much.